listening to LSU Daily with Matt Musso, your home for all things LSU sports. Off and running here on another edition of LSU Daily. Welcome in. Glad to have you with me. Be sure to subscribe, like, share, all of that. Greatly appreciated. You can follow me on social media as well. Twitter, at Musso Matthew on Facebook. And you can find me on Instagram, at Matthew Musso one All of that is as well greatly appreciated. And again, thank you for being here. Quick note before we get into today's topics. This will be the last show of this week. I will be out of town for the rest of the week uh, on a, on one of my best friend's bachelor trips. So we'll be back on Monday uh, after today to start Alabama week and really get going as the LSU puts it all on the line against the Crimson Tide Saturday night in Death Valley. So just wanted to note there, this will be the last show of this week, and we will be back uh, for Monday against Alabama. Today, though, on the show, kind of want to take a big-picture look uh, regarding LSU and the postseason. Uh, on Tuesday's show, obviously, look, we took our first look at uh, at Alabama. We looked at the bye week kind of as a whole, heard some things from Brian Kelly on the Fine Bomb Show. And then, of course, Brian Kelly met with the media on Tuesday evening after practice ended uh, for one of two availabilities this week. He did give an update on Garrett Dellinger. That was really the newsiest thing that came out of there. So we'll pass that along as well. In fact, let's start there, shall we? Let's just start with the injury to Garrett Dellinger. So by now you know, Dellinger goes down in the Texas A&M game. It is a lower leg injury. He tries to work it out on the sideline. Can't. Goes into the locker room for a tape job. The LSU radio broadcast uh, deemed him probable to return. He comes back out of the locker room at halftime. Gets on a stationary bike. He's still in uniform, still in pads, but ultimately never comes back into the game. Redshirt freshman Paul Mubenga is the replacement, and that's a really tough spot for a redshirt freshman to come into on the road in that hostile of environment like Kyle Field when everything was going wrong against you late in that game. He had to grow up in a hurry, and he had some struggles. Brian Kelly on Tuesday evening updated the injury to Garrett Dellinger. It is a high ankle sprain. His status is in doubt for the Alabama game, but Brian Kelly added... You know, they have the bye week and another week. They hope this is just a, a rest week for Dellinger so he can get recovery, heal up, uh, get some treatment, and and hopefully be ready to go for them a week from Saturday when the tide come in. So high ankle spring for Dellinger. If he can't go, you're looking at Paul Mubenga being the, the guy that slides in, and that is very, very, very significant. Um, It would be... Paul Mubanga's first start at LSU, and it would have to come in a extremely meaningful game, in the most meaningful game of the season against the Alabama Crimson Tide. And while, no, Alabama's defense isn't what they have been, that's still a really tough unit to go up against for your first start as a redshirt freshman in a game with that much on the line. This is why we talked about the injury and surgery for Tyree Adams so much because Tyree Adams was your sixth offensive lineman, not your backup tackle, you know, not your backup guard. He, he was your sixth offensive lineman. He was the next guy up at every position except center. He was the guy that has taken the biggest jump and that allowed him to be in that position. And you saw it earlier this season. Coincidentally, Garrett Dellinger was out against Nichols with an upper body injury. A couple nagging injuries there for, for Dellinger, but for the most part, outside of that, he's been extremely healthy. He was back the next week against South Carolina there. But anyway, I, I digress. Dellinger's out against Nichols. It's Tyree Adams that starts in his place at left guard. You had to shuffle the line a little bit. Emory Jones had a little nick there in that game as well, if I'm remembering correctly. Paul Mubenga did see action in that game, but when it came time for someone to start in place of an injured offensive lineman, it was Tyree Adams. And look, don't get me wrong, Tyree Adams isn't some you know veteran guy. He's also a redshirt freshman. 
But the development, the jump was such that, man, they really trusted him, and he performed well in that game. Tyree Adams has actually performed very well in, in any spot that, he, that he's gone in for LSU so far this season. Unfortunately, with that injury, we knew that health was paramount along the offensive line. A spot where you've been pretty darn healthy this year, but you just couldn't afford any type of injury. Dellinger goes down, and now here you are in this spot. I told you all, though, on Tuesday, it feels like the bye week came at a good time. You're finally dealing with nagging injuries if you're LSU. For the most part, up until this point in the season, LSU's injury had all been season-ending, right? Guillory, uh, Emery, Perkins, Malbrew. Like, we go down the list. And yes, that stinks. Like, that sucks. But you could move on. Just, you could, could totally move on knowing they weren't coming back this year. Now you have Daniels dealing with a nagging injury. Dellinger, the nagging injury. You got Allen with turf toe. Hopefully this bye week serves as more of a rest and recovery for those guys, and they can get back and be ready to go uh, against Alabama. So Garrett Dellinger, high ankle sprain. No designation on his status for a week from Saturday against Bama, but Brian Kelly is hopeful that this is a good week of rest and recovery, and he can be ready when the Tigers welcome in the Tide. Okay. Now let's talk big picture. And I could go really deep into this conversation. I will attempt to not do that because we're starting November here from a football standpoint for LSU. There is a lot to a lot of football left to play in the SEC and around the country. But just kind of want to give you a couple scenarios to look out for. And first and foremost, it starts for LSU, win. It's that simple for LSU. But after the Tigers lost to Texas A&M, and look, here on this show, before we even started the recap, I was like, let's get this out of the way. LSU season is not over. Everything that they have to play for is still in front of them. They have one loss in the Southeastern Conference. So anyone who tells you LSU's eliminated and they're out, Don't listen to them because they don't know what they're talking about. They're just spouting off at the mouth. So with that understood, how close is LSU, though? Well, ESPN's Heather Dinich, who spends more time around the college football playoff committee than their families. So if anybody can really get into the mind, I mean, basically, when the college football playoff started, they devoted Heather Dinich to that. She has been covering it you know, ear to ground as closely as you can since its inception in 2014. So if there's one person that is very qualified to tell you how the committee thinks or these are the trends that they have followed in years past, it is Heather Dinich. And because of that, now at the 12-team playoff, she has been starting to release a bracketology every week, uh, you know, of the season. After each week of the season concludes, for week 10, she lists the seeds. And, and the way she does it is how the committee would vote right now. Like if the playoffs started today, this is what it would be. It's not a projection or anything like this. This is what it would be. And that's important. That's how all polls should be done. Anyway, so she gives you, I mean, just like a basketball bracketology, right? The seeds, next four out, first four out, the whole bubble watch, all of that. So... When you look at it, the teams getting the first round buys in the latest, Oregon, the one seed, Georgia, the two, Miami, the three, BYU, the four. She has Tennessee as the 12. Penn State gets the five. Indiana, the nine, A&M, the eight. Clemson, the 11. Ohio State, the six. Boise, your group of five representative, the 10. Many people just think... The group of five representatives is going to slide into that 12 spot. But Boise, the 10. Texas, the 7. Her last two in, obviously Clemson and uh, Tennessee. The first four out, Notre Dame. And Notre Dame is interesting because they have the worst loss of any playoff contending team. And everyone thought their schedule was terrible. And that one loss could hamper them when it comes down to selection day. 
What has happened for Notre Dame is, for one, Texas A&M has been awesome, and they now have a signature win that many people didn't think would be that signature of a win. They have that. Got a lot of football left to play. See how A&M finishes out the season. But right now, that's a strong win on the road at college at Kyle Field. Navy ended up ranked in Notre Dame Shellactum. Army ended up ranked. They get to play them. We'll see what happens with Notre Dame. Iowa State, first four out as the, as the second team out. Kansas State as the third team at 7-1, and one, mind you. Alabama, the fourth team out at 6-2. and two. The next four out, the Ole Miss Rebels, and then your Fighting Tigers of LSU. So right now, LSU is the sixth team out of the playoff field, according to Heather Denich and all her knowledge of the committee. Pitt and SMU rounded out. You could look at that and say six team out. It doesn't feel like you're very close. In fact, though, I mean, you are. Um, and look at what's still in front of you there. LSU beat Ole Miss head-to-head. And, and head-to-head matters a lot to the committee. You can look at that in, in past meetings. Hell, they left Georgia out last season because Alabama beat them in the SEC championship. Georgia had one loss. But Alabama won the only head-to-head matchup. Bama had, you know, what, one loss, and they get put in over Georgia, even though Georgia ran through the the season undefeated. Texas, last season against Alabama. Texas beat Alabama in, what was that, week two, week three of the season, whatever it was. Texas was never ranked below Alabama in the committee's rankings last season because of that head-to-head. So that matters. And Ole Miss is in front of you right now. Ole Miss starts to play Georgia. I like Georgia in that football game. I think Ole Miss, that Ole Miss problem takes care of itself if you're LSU. Obviously, you play Alabama. You have a chance to eliminate them. And that can take care of itself. We already talked about, I mean, and just like that, bam, you're in the first four out at that point. But granted, you beat Alabama with that head-to-head win over Ole Miss. When this projection comes out after, you know, uh, week 11, you're going to be higher than, you know, the fourth team out. The other thing that is intriguing to mention is there are things that are going to happen this weekend while LSU is off. Pitt and SMU play each other, right? I mean, that's that's two teams that while they're behind LSU in this projection, I understand that is two teams who are undefeated in the ACC. And the ACC getting two bids would take a spot, you know, considerably from the SEC. And it's not really a very strong conference. None of those teams, Miami included, currently undefeated in the SEC, in the ACC, excuse me, have any signature win. None of them. They just, they just don't. Now, again, Pitt and SMU play each other. Pitt also has to play Clemson. There are chances. The only team that really doesn't have a chance is Miami until the ACC championship. But just kind of keep an eye on, on the ACC. Same thing in the Big 12. You've got teams that have to play each other. What What is interesting in the Big 12, and I'll just throw this out there, not necessarily for an LSU perspective, but just in general looking at the playoff. Colorado. Because Colorado is obviously a two-loss team, and even in the Big 12, Colorado sits there with with one loss. They're 4-1. and one. Six and two overall. But Colorado's really starting to play good football and they're ranked 23rd. And if they find their way to Dallas for the Big 12 championship, they could totally bid steal. Because right now, Colorado's only path is winning the Big 12 championship. And say they beat BYU, who's going to be projected in the playoff by the time they they match up. Same thing maybe with an Iowa State. One of those undefeated teams. But I lean BYU more. Colorado steals the bid and gets the automatic. Is BYU still in? Does the Big 12 become a two-bid league? Same conversations we always have with basketball and baseball. Because the Big 12 right now is a one-bid league. I I don't care that Iowa State's undefeated. They They have no signature win. Iowa maybe, but that's not really. That's their best win. It's not a great win. So just keep an eye on that as well. But for LSU... And again, like I said, you you have things that will play out this week that could change this projection going forward into Alabama. But for LSU, what you have to do is win. 
seeing them as the quote unquote sixth team out of the field right now, that can sound terrible, but it's really not when you consider everything that is still in front of them and that they and the teams that they've already beaten and the teams that um that are still on their schedule to play. And for what it's worth, back to the old miss thing for a moment if I could, Heather Denich even in in her write up about LSU said, quote, if LSU and Ole Miss both finish as two lost teams, the Tigers head to head win against the Rebels could be the difference in the committee meeting room. Plus, losing in Vegas to USC could wind up looking better than losing at home to Kentucky. That's a bad loss for Ole Miss on their home field as an undefeated team to a Kentucky team that just, I mean, keeps losing. Kentucky is one in five overall, excuse me, one in five in the conference, three and five overall on the season. And it's not really going to get much easier for the Wildcats. So that loss is going to continue to deteriorate. Now, yes, I know USC hadn't been good, but man, you really need old, you, what you need the USC win to look better if it comes down to you and Ole Miss is better, just better than that Kentucky loss. But here's the thing root for Ole Miss to lose. They have to play Georgia. I think they will lose that game. Beat Alabama. Root for Tennessee to lose to Georgia. And quite honestly, I think Tennessee will lose that game to Georgia. And that would knock them out. It's the conversation we had Monday. Finish 7-1. and one. Finish 7-1 and one and 10-2. And, and you're going to be hard, hard, hard to keep out of the playoff. Because then you would also have wins over Alabama and Ole Miss. All right. That's going to wrap it up. Y'all be sure to like, share, subscribe. Please subscribe and share. That's the most important thing. Follow me on social media as well. And again, one more reminder, no show the rest of the week. I'm out of town uh, on a best friend's bachelor trip. Uh, We'll be back on Monday of Alabama week. So be here then for more LSU Daily.